Welcome to Liberating Faith Podcast. I'm so glad that you have tuned in to listen. I'm Dr. Michael Stenhammer, and I have studied the Word of Faith movement for a number of years. I was part of it. I've done a lot of research, and I want to share some thoughts and insights here that might be of help to you. So listen in and see what you think. So story is that most important dimension to understand how our life works, how our belief system or our theology works. Okay, but this is not always, uh, you know, a given. Some of you might already think this way and you think that I'm spending too much time on it, perhaps. But many of us don't under have not understood this yet. You, many of us come from the same background as me, where, where I was taught that the most important thing is principles and ideas. And stories, they are there to somehow just be the ornament of an idea or to illustrate. So a good teaching is something that brings out biblical principles or biblical ideas. And then you, you, you give stories as illustrations of the principles and the ideas. And what we have not understood is that we have put the, the, wag, the wagon before the horse. The buggy is before the horse because actually what drives ideas and principle is the story, is the stories. So this is very, very important to, to just come to terms with this. Because again, what I'm saying is that if you think that the ideas and principles are the most important, you are blind to the most powerful and most shaping dimension of a story. So you will be living within a story world without knowing it. So this is why this, inf th th these di this dimensional story is such an important one to get, this dimensional narrative in our lives, because it will empower you not to be taken captives by, by stories that are not fully biblical and that will shape your life, your passion, your, your, you know, your motivations, your, your priorities in ways which are not really glorifying God the way they should and that, that are not uh, you know, uh, enabling you to be what God has called you to be. And what we've seen in Genesis 3 is that the devil trades in, in false stories. That's what his native tongue is, is to twist the story, is to twist narratives and to place us into these twisted narratives that becomes the lens through which we see the world crookedly and then we act out of that and then we sin. Listen to Alistair McGrath. He has, he has a, a British uh, evangelical theologian, very known, very well respected. And he helps us to see the, where story is most fundamental, that story is more important than ideas and data, and, and that, stories, oh, that stories give rise to, uh, and, and these principles and, and ideas, they arise out of story. But story is the more foundational and therefore more powerful and more influential. He writes this, the Christian faith is ultimately based on narrative set out in the Bible. Okay, so this is very, very important. Then he continues, a narrative is not some kind of literary embellishment of the basic ideas of Christian theology. Rather, it is generally the primary form of disclosure of God's identity and character, which gives rise to those ideas. Ooh. Uh, depending on where you come from, but if you're familiar with the, the, the theology of Alistair McGrath, you will see in this quote that he has done a bit of a journey because about 20, 30 years ago, he was much more idea focused. But here you find in recent years, he has also embraced the, the power of story and, and this, the, the, the important point to see that story is more foundational than ideas and it's story that gives rise to ideas. But the devil, to be honest, has hindered us a lot to see this absolute reality. That story is what's most foundational and most important. But we, as, as maturing theologians, we have to identify this so that we can just penetrate and also capture these stories and, and, and put them uh, under the obedience of Christ. So I believe that this is what Paul speaks about in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, where he says the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought uh, to make it obedient to Christ. Okay, and I, I believe that one, one application of what Paul is saying here is to see the power of story to captive ideas, that we capture ideas and make them uh, obedient to Christ and the true biblical story of who Jesus is and his identity. So 
let's let's uh, move on a bit and and con- continue to think about what is the big the big biblical story, not just the ideas, because it's not the Bible's the biblical story is not just about an idea of justification or the idea uh, or the reality. Of course, is more than an idea, but the reality of justification or the forgiveness of sins. Because if you ask most people, that's what they will end up saying that the Bible teaches us about the forgiveness of sins, which is very true. I mean, the Bible does teach about that, but that's not the complete story. That's part of the biblical story, but that's not the completion of it, right? Even if you start to ask word of faith people, they they might not go as as reformed as just saying it's it's the forgiveness of guilt or the, it's forgiveness from the penalty of sin. They 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 will start to develop it more than that. They will start to say that well, the biblical story is about us regaining our lost place of dominion and authority. That that you know Adam was given this lease uh, over the earth, this power and dominion over the earth uh, to be its god, to be its ruler, God with a little g. But then he gave that authority to Satan. And then Satan became the god of this world. Jesus came to uh, get the authority back from Satan and restored Adam and Eve, that is the believers, back to the uh, authority of ruling and reigning. So our position now is to rule and reign in this world through faith and, and the spiritual laws and establish so the, the, you know, the kingdom of God. Basically, that is, a, in a nutshell, a bit of the Word of Faith story. And you can see that that becomes much more interesting than a lot of other Christian stories that maybe just focus on the penalty of sin and, and forgiveness from sin. Again, I, please hear me out. I am not saying that the Bible doesn't teach about uh, the, the severity of sin and forgiveness of sin and that Jesus died for our sins. I believe that's fully biblical. I hope you hear me that I'm saying that is part of the biblical story, but it's not the full story, you know. So again, please hear me out. Don't think that I'm saying that there is no sin and Jesus did not die for sin. I'm not a liberal theologian. I'm, a, I'm, I'm trying to be within Christian orthodoxy, which in within the biblical story, I'm committed to the Word of God as the inspire, inspired, uh, in, infallible uh, Word of God. Okay, so uh, you know I'm not saying that, but I, I want you to think about these things. This, this is very, very crucial, very important that you consider these things, right? That what is truly the biblical gospel? What is the biblical story, right? And, and you can see that when, when the Word of Faith came in and started to teach these things about regaining authority, about ruling and reigning, about uh, using faith to influence your finances and influence your health and, and all these things, it became a more interesting and more relevant kind of message than many other Christian messages out there that have started to feel uh, kind of yeah old and not really having any bearing on daily life. So Word of Faith came in, the Prosperity Gospel came in and started to be what theologians call contextualized. They started to find where people were at and started to address these questions that people are asking. So what about my material life? What about my body? What about my, my success at work? What about these things? What, what, you know? and, and Word of Faith tried to uh, answer those questions. And I think they should be credited for at least taking those questions seriously. But what happened? is that they didn't do it out of the full biblical uh, story and the understanding of it. They, 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 they told a story that is not scriptural. The, this story they are telling, that, that Adam was created in this high place of position of power and sharing equality with God to rule and reign. That is not how the biblical story begins. And as we said in the first podcast, that is how the biblical story, uh, not fully, but they are closer to how the biblical story ends. That's not how it begins. And and I mean, if you start on the wrong foot, and if you start on the wrong foot, you will never be in sync, you know. So this is a major problem that they, they, you know, they they start on the wrong foot, retelling the biblical story that way. So we we looked at how God's story is about us sharing the life and the rule of God, right? And there's so much to say about those things. And I'm, I'm, I'm just introducing these ideas, right? These, the, or yeah, this story, actually. I'm just introducing these stories uh, and introducing the biblical story from, from this standpoint. But at this, at this time, I want to look at something else. Because I, I was saying that God's ultimate goal is that we will share his life and his rule in a renewed creation. This is extremely interesting and very, very powerful. So I want to unpack that for a moment because this also touches a lot and helps to rectify some of the problems within the Word of Faith. 
So let, let's l- listen to a few scriptures. Let's begin with a few scriptures, okay? So Revelations 5, 9 and 10 is a very important uh, biblical text uh, it, because it, it tells us about our coming future. And it's about John, the revelator. He has a, uh, he has a, a opening, a revelation where he is able to see into, uh, you know, what's going on in, in, uh, in, in, in heaven. And he sees how um, the the living creatures and and the elders fall down to worship, okay. And uh, th- this is what they th- this is what they say. This is the the new song that they are singing in Revelations five nine. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. So uh, this is about the uh, you know the atoning death of Christ and how that purchased for God uh, people and us were well, amazing and you are worthy you know the lamb who was slain uh, this is this is incredible but notice here verse 10 but you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our god kings and priests uh this is uh, this is our place of 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 calling to share god's rule and god's reign to serve our god and they will reign on the earth notice the last place what is the location where is the location for the rain? It's on the earth. So, listening to this scripture, it will set our destiny not in heaven, but in God's renewed creation, in a new heaven, new earth. I don't know where you come from, but if you have been brought up in, in kind of mainstream Pentecostalism or charismatic Christianity, even evangelicalism, word of faith, uh, whatever background you have, you will probably think that I, as I did, that heaven is our destination. And so where we, where will you go when you die? You go to heaven. And what's God's final destination? What's fi- God's final goal? Well, it's just heaven. Okay. So heaven. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you explain some more about heaven? Yeah. Well, it's like an eternal, um, eternal prayer meeting. <laughs> it's an e- eternal uh, worship service. Uh, of course, it's a banquet too, right? But yeah, apart from that, it's that. And so, how will we be there? Well, we, we're just, it's our saint spirits that will be there and we will have, you know, streets of gold. So, so I, I'm not making fun of this. A, a lot of good Christians believe this. But that is not the full biblical story. That's not the full biblical image of what the final end really is. Okay, so listen here again. Let's skip over further down in the book of Revelation to chapter 21. And let's read verses 1 to 3. Then I saw a new heaven and new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. So you can see here God's final goal of relationship. I mean, that's ultimate. That's ultimate number one. God wanting to enter a relationship with us, to share life with us. Yeah. But what we see here also, what I think is extremely important in terms of image and in terms of understand the story, is that what comes down from heaven is a city, the new Jerusalem. It's not a garden. It's not Eden that comes down from heaven. And why is this important? Well, because God's the story is not a return story. Again, it's not the protological story of going back to Eden. God's story is eschatological. It's future-oriented. It's heading into the new Jerusalem. And the new Jerusalem is, 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 is the people of God, but also people living in, in a city. So this is so important that you can see that there's a progression, there's a development in the story. So the, God's plan of salvation was not just a rescue mission to bring us back to Eden. It is to, to propel us into something even greater than that, something much greater than even Eden. It is to place us into the new heaven, new earth, the new Jerusalem where we will share life and rule with God in a way that was not possible in Eden. Why? Because Jesus had not yet come. So Jesus is not just restoring us to something that we lost. Jesus is bringing something through the Holy Spirit that was never, ever possible before he came. 
I'm going to come back to Jesus in a moment, but let's skip over to chapter 22 of Revelations. All right. In verse three, no longer would there be any curse. So now the curse of Genesis three is is erased. It's out. The throne of God and of the Lamb would be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of the lamp, of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will be. It will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. So, if you put these scriptures together. Revelations 5, 21 and 22, you will find here that the image is, the, the progression is, the, the goal of the story is that God will make us into kings and priests that will serve and reign in God's recreated earth forever and ever. Because the trajectory of the new Jerusalem is, not, is coming down from heaven. It's not taking in us from earth to heaven. And at this point, I want to bracket out the whole idea of a rapture or not. I just want to bracket that out. Bracket that out. That's important at some point, but that's not what we're talking about. We, we, that is something that might happen, might not happen, depending on interpretations, before this ultimate end. We're talking about ultimate eschatology. That is just you know, the, the, the quakes before the final. We're talking about the final end of God's story, which is also, uh, as some theologians say, and even Jürgen Moltmann said, it's the beginning of God's story. So the end is just the beginning of the true story of God. But notice here that it is about a renewed life in God's new creation. The hope of heaven is not that we will be taken away from here into a disembodied spiritual state where only our spirits will be saved. The, the trajectory and the prayer and the hope is what is caught also in, in, in the Lord's Prayer. And uh, N.T. Wright helped me to see that, that the trajectory is from heaven to earth. Let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. The prayer is not take us to heaven. It is get heaven here. And heaven will be the, the place where God's, uh, God's will is, is ultimately accomplished and God's will is fully uh, realized. And that will merge with earth and with this, this part of creation, bringing into a new heaven, new earth. And this is connects now with the hope of the Old Testament. The hope of the Old Testament was not to be taken away from physical creation. The hope of the Old Testament was not that God will come and just, uh, you know, snap, uh, snatch them away from here and put them into a spiritual state in heaven. The hope of the Old Testament, which of course is inspired by the same Holy Spirit that inspired Revelation, right, is a renewed creation where God's, God will come with the kingdom of God and establish that here. That is the hope. Isaiah 65 is one of those key texts in the Old Testament that speaks about the renewed creation, the new heaven, new earth. So from verse 17, I'm going to read a bit of a longer passage. This is Isaiah 65, 17 to 25. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. And you, you can see the echoes into the Revelations chapter 21. Never again will there be a, in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. And one who di uh, dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child, and one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. There will be, uh, they will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will the days of my people. My chosen ones will, live, uh, will, uh, will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy 
on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. And uh, if you go and you can read the, the first part of Isaiah 11, you, you see that the hope of the anointed one, the, the root of Jesse, the, the Messiah as we interpret it to be, uh, is also a restored creation coming with that. That the Messiah will bring God's justice into creation. And the justice for is not the destruction of creation, but the restoration of creation. So the whole idea is that God is not thinking like, okay, well, so humanity sinned. Let me just tear up creation and start a spiritual project where I will just save the spirits of humans and bring them to heaven. That's not the biblical story. That's not what the Bible teaches. And again, if you never heard this before, or you might just kind of getting used to that perspective, this might take a while to really digest. I mean, when I started getting used to these teachings and start hear them, I, I was I was really nervous that this would be a heresy. Like, is this really biblical? I mean, I was taught that heaven is our goal, you know, and here people come and say new heaven, new earth. And, and I, I was worried, you know, like, is this is this heretical? And, and I've been, you know, studying a bit and and looking into the Jehovah's Witnesses and their kind of teachings. And I thought that this sounds more like Jehovah's Witnesses teachings than, you know, the, the biblical teachings that I was used to. So I have spent years researching this uh, in for, you know, in, from different perspectives. And I, I, I'm convinced that this is the biblical story, that this is what's taught in the Old Testament. This is the hope of the Old Testament. And this is definitely the vision of the New Testament. And let me give you a few more texts to show you some of these things. And, and I want to just look at, at what Paul is teaching about uh, the final, ultimate end, the eschat eschatological vision, right? And this is extra important because within the Word of Faith, Paul is really privileged as the most important piece of the New Testament or even the whole Bible, which is very problematic, by the way. If we uh, agree on a plenary inspiration of the Bible, that uh, the, every word in all the Bible is inspired, well, how can we have a can canon within the canon? That is, how can we privilege Paul about everyone else? Uh, that That's really problematic position in the word of faith. And especially as they bracket out the Gospels as being less important than Paul's epistles, for example. Uh, now you're heading into some very deep problems theologically when you do that. And there's no way you can, you can justify that from Scripture. That is an idea imported into uh, the word of faith belief system, the way that they privilege Paul, which is uh, that, you know, that that's not Paul's texts are an equal, uh, you know, level with all the other scriptures, uh, you know. So we should not privilege them above anything else. We should keep them together with everything else. So anyway, let's look a bit about Paul's vision. What what did Paul see as the the ultimate goal? Did he did he think of of uh, the ultimate destiny as the saved spirits of human beings in a disembodied heaven? Was that what he thought? Well, let's listen to Romans chapter eight. Uh, it's the key text and people, scholars are saying that it probably is the most important chapter Paul, Paul ever wrote. So uh, let's let's give it some some time from verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Okay, so this teach verse 19, has given rise, rise to some weird teachings within the charismatic camp, right? The revealed sons of God teaching and the idea that this has already happened. But if you study clearly, you find that creation is still waiting. Creation waits. All right, so this is something that they are waiting for. The children of God are not yet fully revealed. We are not yet there in our glorified state. Okay, that is what creation is waiting for. Why? For the creation was subjected to frustration. For not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself would be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the, into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruit of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, for in this hope we were saved, but hope that is, is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we have, if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So Paul's point here is. The creation is under bondage to sin because of humans' sin, 
Adam and Eve sin. The all of creation is still suffering. But creation is eagerly waiting for the day when human beings will be fully restored in Christ through the Spirit to our place of sharing life with God in the rule of God. Then creation will be liberated from its bondage. Can you see that the hope of creation is not annihilation or total destruction and to be eradicated? The hope here is not to be taken away from creation, that one day we will be glorified in, in a heavenly spiritual state. No, that God will glorify us, that we will partake of His life and His reign, and through that the rest of creation will be finally restored and renewed in life. Exactly as the, the, the hope of Isaiah 65, as we read just before. So here, creation is longing. Creation is hoping. Creation is waiting. This is a renewed eschatology. This is the, the end time goal of a renewed heaven and earth. Okay, so, so some people, if, when they get used to this idea, or at least when they start to hear it, they might say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fine. That's the millennium. But once after the millennium, that then will be taken out of here. Well, no, this is not the hope of creation for just, you know, possibly a period of a thousand years. This is the ultimate hope. And if you study Paul, you won't find that he just puts this in a, in a limited uh, time. This is the beginning of God's eternal, uh, eternity with God. So Romans 8 is very clear that creation is longing for uh, deliverance and liberation from sin and death. And that will happen at the point where human beings are finally glorified. That means we are finally sharing God's life and God's rule. And God's life and God's rule then will somehow be mediated through us to the rest of creation. And that is what creation is longing for. So the Bible does not speak about the total destruction of the earth. The Bible doesn't speak about that creation will be just, uh, you know, thrown out and burn up. And I, I know texts that it can be used that way, and we, we, we'll, we'll address them uh, in a little while. But it's important for you to see that the, the, the momentum of the biblical story is towards a new heaven and new earth, a renewed creation, where heaven and earth will be merged and married into one. So even other texts from Paul that are really important to look at, they're, they're kind of shorter portions, but you can look at Colossians 1, 19 and 20, for example. He says, For God was pleased to have all His fullness to dwell in Him, that is Jesus, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through His blood shed on the cross. What is Paul's vision here? Paul's vision is not a reconciliation of human spirits or human souls with God only. That is included, but it's more. Paul's vision here is a, is a reconciliation of heaven and earth, of everything on earth and heaven. And for those who are more kind of nervously oriented, and, and some of us are, and I might belong to that group as well, when you hear that, you might think of universalism, the idea that everybody will be saved. And, and God, by, by saying this, that He reconciled to Himself all things, that might some might interpret that meaning every human being also, that everybody will be saved at the end of the day. It doesn't really matter what you believe, your religion, uh, you know, how you live, your ethics, uh, as long as everybody will be reconciled at the end of the day. I... I in a sense, in one sense, that you would hope so, but but uh, I don't read. To be honest, that's not how I read scripture. I, I think there are too many scriptures that that speak against such an idea of of the uh, the universal salvation of everyone. Uh, I don't I don't see that. I see a wide and a narrow road, and so I, I don't believe that this is teaching universalism at all. But it's teaching about the renewal of all things in terms of renewing of creation, of all of creation being renewed. And those who want to, those humans who want to be part of that, and it's through them that that renewal will also take place. Ephesians one eight to, to ten is also a key text here in Paul when he speaks about this this cosmic renewal, right? That this new heaven, new earth, and he says that this love that he lavished on us, this grace that he lavished on us, with all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. To, put, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things 
in heaven and on earth under Christ. What is the goal? To bring unity to all things. That in Christ, there will be the merging of, of, and the unification, the marriage of heaven and earth in Christ. That's the goal. Ephesians 1.10. That in Christ, there will be, as Andrew writes, as the marriage of heaven and earth. This is the goal. This is what Paul's vision is for creation. And as we've seen, that is the vision in the, in the book of Revelation. That is the vision in the Old Testament. Listen to Michael Gohan and all, uh, Albert Walters. They, they written a book called Creation Regained. And I, I recommend that as a good start. It's a thin book and it, it's written from a reform perspective. So, but it still gives even us Pentecostals and other charismatics a good, good, in, good start to start to reflect upon these things. But they say this, in the history of the church, Redemption has often been misunderstood. Okay, whoa, this is very interesting because this is not just in the history of the church. This very much applies to the faith and prosperity gospel. They have also misunderstood redemption. So they say, how has redemption been misunderstood? It has been misunderstood to be salvation from creation rather than salvation of creation. Wow. Well, I... It's so good. I better read that again, right? So in the history of the church, redemption has often been misunderstood to be the salvation from creation. That is that we are taken away from this place. One day, yes, we'll go to glory. And all these hymns, right, to speak about us being taken away and going into glory and so on, right? Salvation from creation rather than salvation of creation. And if that doesn't shock you, let me see if you're shocked by this. This is a quote from Richard Middleton, and he has written some phenomenal work on this. And I'm going to recommend his book at the end of the podcast. But he says, the term heaven is never used in Scripture for the eternal destiny of the redeemed. I gave a bit of pause there <laughs> for, for you to kind of let that sink in for a moment. The term heaven is never used in Scripture for the eternal destiny of the redeemed. Because the eternal destiny of the, of the redeemed, God say people, is in a new heaven, new earth. That's where we will be. So in this vision, we are actually seeing resurrected creation, not just a resurrected Jesus. That the resurrection of Jesus was the beginning of the resurrected bodies of human believers, and the resurrection of all of creation. So God is not after destroying, but renewing creation. Th this, is, this is incredible that we are meant to live in God's renewed creation. So if we just take it a step further and, and start look at 1 Corinthians 15, and what about us as human beings? What, so God is, is looking for a resurrected creation or a renewed creation. What about us as human beings? Well, God is expecting us or is planned for us to have resurrected, recreated, glorified human bodies. Th this again might, might hit us a bombshell, and I hope it does if you have never heard this. Because within the word of faith, you expect that only your spirit will be saved. Because it, sin is, is part of our flesh. That, that's how they interpret the body and the soul. The flesh is what the soul and the body working together. And they will be destroyed. And our spirit, which is the only um, uh, born-again part of us, that the only uh, righteous part of us, is the only part that will be delivered. And of course, they, they hold to, to a spiritual body theology, right? That you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. That is the, the classical word of faith definition. Some other word of faith groups have started to kind of shift maybe on that, but uh, that, that would be the very center. I have a good friend uh, who did his PhD work on this, uh, Chris Anthony or Dr. Anthony. He, he, his thesis uh, is built partly around the, the idea or the, the, the claim that trichotomy or the, that you are a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body, and you are a spirit, have a soul, live a body, is the very center of the Word of Faith theology system. So very interesting work. But yeah, so the, the, this idea then, that, that you are only a spear being. That doesn't make the body very important. But no, I'm going to come back to that in a moment within the Word of Faith. But what about the biblical story? Well, the biblical story has clearly the goal of resurrected human bodies. That the resurrection of Jesus was the beginning of the day that all of us will be resurrected in Christ through the power of the Spirit. And you can study especially 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
study that chapter out, you will find that the goal there, the hope, the Christian hope, is physical bodily resurrection. Physically bodily resurrection is a Christian hope, okay? And it, it began with Jesus, and what started in Jesus will uh, be effective even into all human beings who believe in him, who are united with him by faith. So this, this, is, this is very, very important. And uh, this is also, uh, I mean, the importance of even Jesus being resurrected in a human body, that he has still a glorified human body. That's not something Jesus left behind. That's something he still has. He has a glorified human body. And, and th that brings the importance of these narratives where Jesus was eating after his resurrection. That is to show that his body is still a glorified physical body. It's not just a, a, a vision or a, just a spiritual entity of some sort. Paul speaks of it as a spiritual, uh, and spiritually transformed body in 1 Corinthians 15. So this is what, what Jesus has come to give us, and that is the Christian hope. The Christian hope is not that we will be spirit beings saved in an immaterial, disembodied heaven. That has never been the hope. Listen to Roger Olson, who is a uh, historical theologian, uh, and he says this, It would be impossible to discover any single point of greater agreement in the history of Christian thought than this one. Okay, so wow. And he, he knows his stuff. He's a very well-respected uh, historical Christian theologian, and he says that you cannot find one single point of greater agreement. And it, So we better listen. What is this point of, great, of, of greater agreement? He says the future bodily resurrection of the dead is the blessed hope of all who are in Christ Jesus by faith. The future bodily resurrection of the dead. That has been the Christian hope from, from the very start of the Christian church. Then at some point it got lost. But it is the biblical faith. And thankfully, this is getting restored. Very much so within the, the understanding of the biblical story about the new heaven, new earth. And, and we partaking uh, in the new heaven, new earth through resurrected, glorified bodies. So Jesus came to save us, spirit, soul, and body. All of us. All part of us. Whether you look at spirit and soul as different or just uh, synonymous for our uh, immaterial dimension or our being, it doesn't really matter. But what we're saying is Jesus came to save all of us. He didn't, he didn't and all, all of our being in a sense. He didn't just come to say, well, I'm just here to save your, your spirit. So he came to save all of us. And what's really interesting here is the transfiguration of Jesus. When he went up on the Mount uh, Tabor and was transfigured before the eyes of the disciples. You find this in, in Luke chapter 9. And it's, it, you remember how Jesus went up on the mountain. And then uh, as he's praying, uh, his, his appearance is, is transformed, is changed. And his clothes became, uh, Luke writes, as bright as a flash of lightning. And two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. Okay, so verse 32, Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with them. Okay, so th there's that, that display of glory. Okay, and in verse 35, it says, the voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son whom I've chosen. Listen to him. So there are different ways of interpreting the importance and significance of the transfiguration of Jesus. But I, I, I think it's very interesting that the theologians and the historical Christian traditions that interpret this as the importance of Jesus being human, not just showing his divine glory and his divinity, which is true, but this is the glory of God shining through the human body of Jesus. So in a sense, it is showing the greatness of Jesus, but it's also showing us our future place of glorification in Christ. That the glory of God shines through his human body is God's goal for us as well. That one day we will be so baptized in the Spirit and so saturated by the Spirit that the life of God will shine through us too in a glorified body. This is not Jesus leaving his body behind. This is the glory of God penetrating and shining through his physical body, his human, his human body. And of course, fully being the Son of God, the second member of the Trinity, He was, He is, and He will always be. But still, this will, will kind of get, bring, brings us to that place of, of the glory of God shining through our humanity. This is what God wants. The transfiguration of Jesus and, and is also 
uh, an image for what God wants for all of humanity, for His glory to shine through us into the rest of creation. And the rest of creation will then be redeemed from its, uh, its bondage to sin and death and be renewed. Wow. This helps me a lot when it comes to thinking about the, the problem within the word of faith, thinking that we are already within this renewed creation, or that we are in the kingdom of God now by faith. And you can just go like, hey, are we trans? I mean, have you seen this kind of glory? <laughs> you know, as you see in the transfiguration of Jesus? No, you don't. So, of course not. We don't have the fullness of the kingdom of God now. I mean, it's just it's just is. So, you know, and it's very interesting that the transfiguration does not play any part within the word of faith uh, narrative. But this is the, the also, uh, perhaps, I mean, that's a way of re interpreting this as an image for what God wants to do with all human beings who believe in, in Christ, who are joined with him by faith through the Spirit. So this is the, the, the importance of the body, that God wants to, to show his glory through our body. Not the body in that sense is not a problem. This is very important. And let's talk about the place of the body within the Word of Faith. But for that, I think it's good to start uh, another podcast and to end this because uh, we will have to dis discuss some things that will take some time. So I hope that this podcast has been a blessing to you. Reach out to me at www.liberating.faith. I'd love to hear your story. I'd love to hear your input and your comments. If you have things you want me to, to somehow address in, in, in podcasts or in videos, let me know. Until I see you in videos and podcasts, God bless you.